At this point in my career, predictive astrology is undoubtedly my favorite branch of astrology. I love nothing more than being able to collect data, organize measurements for a client, and see right in front of me, as clear as day, what those measurements are suggesting about the person's life potential, about their reality, and what they can anticipate over the next year or so of their life. It is truly remarkable. It is where the rubber kind of meets the road with fate and our understanding of how we can direct our faded energies at any given time. And that's where we get to use our free will. So that's the blending. But in this video, what I want to do is start to maybe demystify this process that astrologers go through when they make predictions. Now, of course, I can only speak for myself. Every astrologer has his or her own wheelhouse, special set of tools and predictive techniques that will work for him or her. And we all have different training, okay? So we all have different teachers and different influences that will color our style as we develop our own unique style as predictive astrologers. And I encourage you to do the same for sure. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start by learning skills, techniques, basic application of these techniques. Let me back up and of course, introduce myself. For those of you who are new here, welcome to my channel. My name is Maria De Simone. I am a professional astrologer. You can find out more about me and my work at insightfulastrology.com where I offer consultations and I have an entire astrology school. What sets my astrology school apart from others is that I use my students' birth charts in the lesson plans, in the homework assignments, and it gives a very personal, unique angle to learning astrology. It makes it very relatable, very relevant, and really interesting. So I have classes ranging from beginners all the way through advanced. And this video is actually inspired by my upcoming predictive astrology masterclass. Registration is open for this class now. And if you register before the deadline, which I believe is uh, March 1st or 3rd. Sorry, I can't remember. It's on my website. You will save $50 off of the tuition. And this predictive astrology masterclass will teach you the art of solar arc directions, which is one of the predictive methods that I use. And then we tie it all together because I use a combination of transits, secondary progressions and solar arc directions whenever I make predictions for my clients. And I teach my students how to do this. I teach you guys my method, what I use every single day in my actual client practice. And so if you have already studied transits, if you have already studied secondary progressions, this masterclass would be the class for you because I introduce solar arc directions and then I show you how to tie it all together. If you aren't at that level yet, please go to my website, check out all of my class options and hop on the waiting list for the class that is right for you. So in this class, in this video, sorry, in this video, I have to be clear, it is an advanced video. But even if you are an astrology enthusiast, someone who's curious about the process that an astrologer will go through to get those predictions for you, you might be interested in watching this video because it is going to show you, at least my way, from my framework of training. And again, my way is certainly not the only way. It is just the way that works for me over the course of my career. So I think every astrologer will agree that the starting point for predictive astrology is transit. Everybody needs to have a thorough understanding of transit. And that is where the planets are in the sky at any given time in relation to the birth charts. After that, the next branch of predictive astrology that most predictive astrologers want to study is secondary progressions. Secondary progressions are a symbolic predictive tool that measures your internal 
soul's development, your readiness to have certain experiences. And when those secondary progressed aspects are triggered by uh, something going on in the sky, a transit, an eclipse, or a, an aspect to your natal birth chart, then the event is likely to manifest for you. Okay, so that's those are the two main predictive techniques that I would say most astrologers learn. After that, some astrologers, like myself, many actually, will learn solar arc directions, which is another form of progression. However, this form of progression is very external, very palpable, and connected to immediacy of world events occurring in your life because solar arc directions are a form of progression that use the sun's motion, rate of motion, and applies it to every planet in your chart. Now, I'm not going to go into the mechanics of progressions or solar arc directions in this video. You really need to take proper classes to learn the ins and outs of these techniques. And you can take those classes with me or another astrologer of your choice. You have to do your research. So this video is going to show you what happens after you've learned all these three techniques, how you then apply it into an actual consultation with someone. And I'm going to show you how I create my measurements. It's called a time search. And any astrology software program will have this ability to create time searches. And the time search is the golden ticket for prediction. If you are a predictive astrologer, you really need that time search. And you're not going to get a time search from a free astrology website or uh, any place that you can create free birth charts. You really have to invest in astrology software for the, uh, for the time search. So the, the one thing I want to say before I share my screen and show you how I get down to business with all this is I want to remind you that predictive astrology is a branch of judicial astrology, which has roots. It's, the, it's connected to the origins of astrology. Astrology's function from thousands of years ago was predictive in nature. And because it is under the branch of judicial astrology, any predictive astrologer must have the ability to make a proper judgment call about a certain measurement, about a collection of measurements altogether and what they mean. And so you don't want to get into predictive astrology until you are somebody who understands, appreciates, values the art of judicial astrology. And if judicial, judicial astrology scares you or doesn't make your heart sing the way that it does for me, you might not want to practice that area of astrology. You might want to stick to maybe natal astrology, maybe evolutionary astrology, counseling astrology, other branches of astrology that don't emphasize prediction as much. But for me personally, and if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you have an interest in this branch of astrology as well. I really love this tool that we have available to us to take the temperature of what could be happening in our lives and how to best direct the energy. And the art of being a judicial astrologer means that you have to communicate what you see, honestly, judiciously. You cannot make something up that's not there just because you don't wanna disappoint your client. You cannot paint this picture of unicorns and rainbows if you clearly see your client is having a crisis year ahead. You may not be God, but you are God's messenger. That's how I see myself, okay? I am the messenger of higher consciousness. Whatever God, higher power there is, we'll all find out when we're dead. And I truly believe that I wouldn't have this ability if that higher power did not want me to communicate the information I was getting to other people. And the whole point of that is to be helpful. So, Counseling astrology is an art that is completely separate from predictive astrology. And I need you to understand this. When I am teaching you about predictive astrology, 
I am not teaching you how to communicate and counsel that information. That is a whole other art form. And there is a way to communicate difficult information in sensitive, honest dialogue. But that is not what this video is going to cover. This video is purely covering how to organize measurements so that you learn how to make the proper judgments for prediction, All right? So if you're excited, let's get to it. I'm going to share my screen. And in this example, I am going to just use my own birth chart because to be quite honest, I am not excited enough about celebrity birth charts to spend the time doing the research to go and use them as an example. And I didn't want to have to wait to get a client's permission via email and all that. I got in the mood to do this video today and I jumped on it and I said, let me go with my energy. So I'm going to use my birth chart to show how to organize measurements and make predictions. The first rule about predictive astrology is that you have to always start with the natal birth chart, which is also called the natal promise. So if it is not promised as potential in someone's birth chart, it's probably not going to happen because the energy is not there to begin with. But if one of those predictive cycles is triggering something that could happen, then when you see the cycles all clustered up, you know that the event is going to take place. This one video, it is impossible to make you an expert predictive astrologer. I do not want anyone to think that you could you know, hang a shingle and use the, this one video as your starting point. You have to understand that this video is compiling three classes that I teach, first of all, and years and years of experience. So you must practice, you must. And I am so adamant about a self-imposed apprenticeship if you're gonna do this work. I did a self-imposed apprenticeship where I studied people's birth charts in exchange for feedback and practice for one year. You may not want to do it for one year, but I do suggest that you, you examine this for yourself. At least six months, you wanna do this so that you have an opportunity to practice. So just think about that. I think that is the ethical way to approach being an astrologer. And I also think that it is a way to build your confidence as an astrologer, especially a predictive astrologer. All right, so let me share my screen. The astrology software that I'm using is WinStar Professional. So you can find out about that particular software at astrologysoftware.com. I am not being paid a commission. I have no skin in the game of which astrology software you use. This is the astrology software that I have used since I started learning astrology. And it is just easy for me to navigate. And I love the you know familiarity of it. So I stick to it. You do your research. You find out the astrology software that's best for you. So what I'm showing you is the way to do it through WinStar Professional. I, I don't know about you know other astrology software, how to do it, but you can find that out based on whatever software you have and the tech support connected to it. So first, I am going to show you, you should all see my birth chart. <clears throat> Now, we're not really gonna spend time on my birth chart because this is predictive astrology, but we're gonna go back to the birth chart after we've organized the measurements to see how we can frame our analysis and make our predictions, okay? So the first step in WinStar Professional is to go to an area up here on the top left, Sorry, my navigation. So you're going to go to extras up here on the left. Then you're going to click on time search. Now, ignore that. That shouldn't have happened. Okay. You don't see the screen yet. You still see my birth chart. I'm going to stop the share for a second and reshare it, showing you what just popped up. And what popped up is the time search window. Okay, I'm going to make this bigger so that you can see it. Now, this is not our measurements. This is just what automatically showed up. So now in the left, in the right corner here, the right top corner, you're going to click on new search. So 
click that drop down box and this new window comes up. Now this window, the way that I like to organize my measurements is the following. Uh, remember, other astrologers have other ways of doing this. This is my way. And this is exactly how I prepare for a consultation. So today is February 22nd. We could leave that date and let's do it for one year out. Normally when I talk to a client, I will create this time search for about uh, 12 to 15 months ahead, not more than that, because it is really important to understand and fully integrate your cycles that are available now. No point in looking at five years ahead when you have a certain set of measurements active for this next year, okay? Focus on what's in front of you. So here on the left box, it says transits to natal. One of the measurements I use are transits to natal. And here are our search planets here. I teach in my transits class that the faster moving planets, also known as the personal planets, we don't care about the transiting moon, the transiting sun, transiting Mercury, transiting Venus, or transiting Mars in so far as their ability to create major life events in your world. They are not the key players that are going to, by transit, create major life-changing events. They are supporting planets, supportive energy. And in my advanced classes, I show you how to go back and use these personal planets to then find trigger dates where you can take a prediction that you see in, let's say, a three-month range happening for someone and use these personal planets to consolidate that into maybe a two-week period of time, sometimes even an exact day, okay? So that's not what I'm doing in this video. I'm just showing you these measurements. The measurements that I use for transits are, I will search Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto to all of your birth planets and your birth angles. So that box I'm leaving the same. I also like to click on house ingress because I like for it to be right in front of me on my time search to see when one of those outer planets transits into a new house in your chart. And I do use the Placidus house system for those of you who are wondering. The aspects are Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic aspects. Now, when I was trained, by Noel Till on how to create these measurements and time searches, he taught his students to focus on the hard aspects only. I started using his you know, learning instruction and as I found my own style, I decided that for me, I liked seeing all of the Ptolemaic aspects, even though I do not overemphasize these soft supportive aspects, because it is really the hard aspects that bring developmental life tension to all of us and major energies. Okay, so we have that, click okay. The next measurement I'm going to focus on are progressed to natal. So I'm gonna click on that box, progressed to natal. I'm leaving the search planets and the target planets as is with the exception of, I like to add the midheaven and the ascendant in my search. And for the, the events box here, I will click on sign ingress, house ingress, and stations. I like to see all of that for progressed to natal aspects. That's my preference. Click on OK. And then we go to arc to natal because that is the third technique that I use in preparation for client. Again, I leave the search planets alone with the exception of adding the midheaven and the ascendant. And then, and of course it's Ptolemaic aspects across the board, everything is Ptolemaic aspects. And then we're going to click okay. That is it for me. I do not on my turn time search, use the progress to progressed aspects, even though they can be interesting. I don't need the extra noise. This is a simplified, very direct way to focus on measurements. So now I'm going to click OK. And what you see in front of you is 
the exact time search that I would be preparing if I were my own client. Okay, so I would print this out and you can see, I'll scroll down to show you. It's, it goes through February 19th and then that's the last important measurement that it decided to show, okay? So now I would print out the client's birth chart, have it on the left side, print out the client's time search, have it on the right side. Then I get my handy dandy highlighter. You're gonna need your highlighters for this because now from this page, we have to decide as judicial astrologers, which measurements are important, which measurements are going to start talking to us about big themes and what's happening for our client. So this is gonna get a little messy, but I'm going to attempt to show you what I would highlight. And again, a full explanation of why I would highlight what I highlight uh, and then how I use it really can't be expressed in this video. It has to be demonstrated through proper instruction and through my classes. So I'm only gonna show you what I highlight and explain why. Give me one second. I just have to close my office door. Sorry guys, that was real life interruption. One of my kids came home and I didn't expect them home, so I had to shut the door. Okay, so now, the first measurement that I would highlight is this particular progression. This progression of Mercury to Mars. So I would highlight the date, the event, which is Mercury conjunct Mars, the type of aspect, which is a progressed to natal, okay? Then, I go down my time search. You don't highlight every little thing here. You wanna give it a, a, a once over, highlight the major aspects, focusing on the squares and oppositions and conjunctions, and then go back and decide if you're going to add any other measurements after, right? So the next thing that I would highlight occurs on March 8th. Saturn square, the moon is occurring then, and this is a transit, transiting Saturn square, the natal moon. The next aspect that I would highlight after this on my first home over would be March 27th, solar arc ascendant equals Jupiter. Now, when I teach you solar arcs, you're going to learn that even though that's a square, we don't say it that way. Solar arcs are communicated as point A equals point B. It doesn't matter if it's a square, an opposition, or a conjunction. What matters is that they are connected. So how you say it is solar arc ascendant equals Jupiter. Moving forward, I would then notice that on March 31st, transiting Jupiter is conjunct the natal sun. And then right after that, April 7th, what catches my eye is that solar arc Venus equals Mercury. Right after that, April 20th, I noticed that transiting Uranus is conjunct Mercury. Right after that, the same day, Jupiter is conjunct Mercury. And if you know what's happening in astrology collectively, that day happens to be the day of the big Jupiter Uranus conjunction. It just so happens to be hitting my natal Mercury placement. And that is why you are seeing those measurements both occur on that day. I would also note that on May 20th, transiting Jupiter ingresses into my second house by transit. Again, I use the Placidus house system. One of the reasons why I prefer to use the Placidus house system or a quadrant house system in my predictive analysis is because I rely heavily on transits secondary progressions and solar arc directions. And the house cusps are very sensitive to events actually occurring in your life. So track this for yourself, okay? And, and see if you relate to that. All right, so I then see a progressed moon square midheaven. I'm gonna skip that for now because I know the motion of the progressed moon and I, that might not be super important. So I'm gonna skip that for now. 
I'm going to keep going down and nothing is really compelling until we get to progressed midheaven trine Saturn. That's actually very interesting. And it's actually echoed by transiting Saturn sextile the midheaven. So because I noticed that progression, I am now going to include Saturn sextile the midheaven, whereas before maybe I wouldn't have as much. But I do feel that that is noteworthy and interesting. Okay. So now I'm going to have to make a bit of a mess because I need to scroll down and show you the rest of this time search. And actually, it's pretty much over. Okay, so that's 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 good. I'm going to go back up and just get those highlights back to where they belong. That should do it. Okay, so this is my time search. This is get my ephemeris. This is how I would prepare for the session. And you might be wondering, well, how do I know what's important? This comes with experience and instruction, okay? The, and, and so again, this video, I can't explain every nuanced detail of how to learn what's important. You really need to study with an astrologer. But if you're an astrology enthusiast who wonders how does an astrologer prepare for your session, this is how I prepare. So one, a couple of points here. We're not done with our prep work yet because I teach this in my transits class. This, this hit here, this hit, it's for example, of Uranus conjunct Mercury. When you study transits, you learn that transiting Uranus will give three mathematical hits. So it's going to make three passes over a planet or a point in your chart. And you have to know whether it's, you're looking at the first, second, or final hit. I know that this is the final hit. So I would write in the white box, final here, to alert me to the fact that that is the grand finale of this particular transit, and it's moving on after this hit. Now, I would also go back in my ephemeris and look back and find those other two dates of Uranus conjunct Mercury, and I would write them down here. I'm not going to do that now to save time, but I would because I would want to understand that pattern and be able to communicate that energy and go back to the first hit and talk about well, what might have happened in my client's life relating to Uranus Mercury energies. But that is the final hit of that particular transit. So for outer planet transits, you want to pay attention to is it the first hit, the second hit, the final hit? Neptune and Pluto are also guaranteed to give you three mathematical hits, but sometimes they can give you five. And it's your job as an astrologer to know this and to document it for your clients if they're having a five hit or a three hit pass of a Pluto or a Neptune transit. Uranus will give three, Saturn and Jupiter will give either one, but sometimes it can give three if Saturn or Jupiter goes retrograde over the planet or point, okay? So that is one thing that you have to do manually you have to go back and make sure that you have that written down. And then the second thing that I'm going to do is I like to look at, well, what else eclipse-wise over this next year is happening? And you need your ephemeris for this. And you look in your ephemeris box on the eclipses. And I only really focus on eclipses that are making conjunctions to a planet or a point in the birth chart. There are two eclipses that are making conjunctions for me. Okay, so the 325 eclipse, which is right here. So I'm going to write 325 is a lunar eclipse. So I would write L E. And all of this, by the way, wouldn't be as big. It would be next to or close to the 325 area. So this eclipse is exactly conjunct my natal Pluto in my sixth house. And that is possibly significant. Pluto is in my sixth house. It rules my eighth house. And Pluto connects to a Venus-Pluto opposition in my chart. It's pretty busy when we go back to the natal promise. 
So we don't know how important that is yet, but I'm going to notate it. Then on April 8th, there is a solar eclipse. And I know this is really sloppy. It would not be as sloppy if I was drawing it by hand. The solar eclipse is at 18 and change of Aries, which is conjunct my ascendant. Okay. Those are the two eclipses. I will put that in my notes in the white part of the time search. And now I'm going to study this and I'm going to sit with it. And for me, because I have a lot of experience doing this, this is pretty fast. For you, it might take time. It's going to take time at first. But the more you do it, the faster this becomes because the synapses in your brain connect much easier with this language the more practice you give it. So for me, I am very much seeing themes for the year ahead for this person who happens to be me of not only career and financial energy, but also potential energy connected to communications in a, in a very significant way. And that's a big umbrella. These are just general insights that I'm noticing here. But what really alerts you to this is the fact that when we look at the progressions, we know that by the end of November, progress midheaven is trying Saturn. That's a really nice progression, especially when you consider that Saturn in this birth chart rules the 10th house. So the progress midheaven is making a trine to the ruler of the midheaven. That's big. And that's one of the reasons why I'm including the Saturn sextile midheaven and this is all showing evidence of stable, authoritative career growth, steady career growth. Jupiter going into the second can potentially bring more money by itself. It doesn't necessarily. It's just expanding that area of one's life. It has to attach to other things in the chart to suggest more money. And here, when we do our second comb through, we see that in this case, it actually is suggesting some potential for more money here because in June, Jupiter will make a sextile to Venus. And Venus is the ruler of the second house of earned income in this birth chart. So there are indications that there's more money and there's career progress and growth. But this is general for the year ahead, right? Now over here, we see this whole cluster of energy that's really interesting. Solar arc ascendant equals Jupiter is a very auspicious solar arc to have. It is success, plain and simple. It can be success connected to relationships since it's the ascendant descendant axis, but it can also be success connected to one's personal identity and growth and development. So that's good news. This is there's an energy here, a flavor. The flavor that you should all be getting if you're a predictive astrologer is that putting all this together so far, we're getting some really positive indications that the year ahead should be one of growth and opportunity for Maria. Yes, we see Saturn square the moon out here, March 8th, but it only happens once. It's not three hits and it's kind of isolated. So that is the most stressful cycle that we're seeing in March also possibly connected to that lunar eclipse, but that's an isolated event. It's not the flavor of the entire year. So we don't have to dwell on that. We may address it at some point with our client, what that could mean, but we don't have to dwell on it right now. We're looking for the flavor. And the flavor seems to be opportunity. The opportunity is very much Jupiter related. Ascendant equals Jupiter. Jupiter is in the 12th house of my birth chart in its sign of dignity, Pisces, and Jupiter is exactly sextile my midheaven in my birth chart. So that's pointing to career advancement. Jupiter rules my ninth house in my birth chart. The ninth house is rules astrology. It rules uh, higher education. Okay. So opportunities are showing up with teaching, vibration, communications. Can you see this? The Mercury energy. Solar arc Venus to Mercury, transiting Uranus to Mercury, transiting Jupiter to Mercury. That Jupiter-Uranus conjunction exactly on my Mercury. All of this is happening between March 27th and April 20th. 
and it is punctuated by this eclipse on my ascendant on April 8th. The eclipse on my ascendant is echoing the solar arc of ascendant to Jupiter. So you see how measurements are starting to come together. And if my client asked me what month would be the busiest, the most opportunity driven, I would absolutely suggest that April is a big month for this client, for myself. April is going to be huge. And there may be, there might be important developments for me at this point connected to communications, connected to academic achievements, connected to teaching, connected to writing opportunities, maybe publishing opportunities, if that's what I'm focused on. All of that is showing. Now, that's not the only theme though. Jupiter is conjunct the sun and the sun in my chart, even though it's in the first house of self, the sun rules my fifth house, the topic of the fifth house. This peaks on March 31st, then on May 9th, the sun is sextile, Saturn is sextile the sun. So the sun does receive support this year. The sun again rules my fifth house because Leo is on the cusp of the fifth house in my birth chart. So I would also bring up the topic of children, what lucky energy, lucky breaks are happening potentially connected to children while well, my daughter's getting married. And she is getting married between these two dates here, okay? So there is a wedding. There is a very happy event for one of my children. Some of you might be thinking, well, the fifth house also rules love, romance. And Maria has this Jupiter sun conjunction and the solar arc of Venus, which is the significator of love and relationship to Mercury, and then an eclipse on her ascendant. And all of that is taking place between March 31st and April 8th. So I would also, if my client came to me and said, what does my love life look like for this year? I would say, well, based on these measurements, first I would ask, are you single or attached? Okay, I'm single. So if you're single, you see these measurements and you say, okay, so arc ascendant equals Jupiter. We have Jupiter to the sun. The sun rules the fifth house. We have solar arc Venus to Mercury and a solar eclipse on the ascendant. That is four measurements that are suggesting the possibility of romantic energy. And that does happen between the very end of March through the end of May. But that's when it's all clustered together in exactness. You have to also consider that the eclipse develops over six months. Solar arc is exact on one day, but it opens up six months before and it is highly active for six months after. Same thing for a progression. A progression will be exact on a certain day, like here, this progressed midheaven trine Saturn is exact in November, but it actually really opens up and heavily influences the native a good six months before. So that brings us to uh, November would be the first month, October, September, August, July, June. So really June, is when this energy of career takeoff seems to be flying. And sure enough, we go back now and we see that June 2nd, progressed moon is square, the midheaven. That doesn't have to be a bad square. That square can be symbolizing that the energy is about to take off for Maria professionally. And I would then say to my client, the month of June is a very big month for you professionally. And financially, whatever you're planning, communications-wise, teaching-wise, whatever you've got cooking here, Maria, from March through April, it looks like you're launching it in June, and you will be launching it very successfully. And you're going to continue to see that success throughout the end of the year. Okay, so this is how the conversations start. When you're looking at these measurements, taking it all into consideration, and remember, we have this progression here of Mercury to Mars. Mars is my chart ruler since I have Aries rising. And so it's exact February, but it's going to also be active March, April, May, June, July, heavily. That is another corroborating factor to all of the communications energy that is happening here for me in my life over the next year. So I think you can see that. And, and hopefully you're starting to get a feel for how this all comes together 
in a cohesive conversation and also judicial analysis. Now, I want to make another point. I teach this to my students very, very carefully. I do not make a major life prediction for anybody unless the rule of three is fulfilled. I go into what this rule is. It's an ancient rule in predictive astrology. It is a very, very smart way for you to maintain your accuracy as a predictive astrologer, but also to check yourself ethically before you make a prediction for someone. And so you have to see the measurements suggesting the same theme at least three times. So we are seeing at least three measurements connected to big events in fifth house matters. And the fifth house matters will either be love or the topic of children, possibly both. We also see big evidence for career and financial expansion. Okay, and I already reviewed all of those, it was way more than three. And that's how it's going to work out. You're going to see very often that it is not just three measurements that a client will have. A client is gonna keep screaming in the birth chart over and over and over again, okay? So to just go back to the birth chart very quickly, to reiterate how you have to analyze everything connected to the natal promise, because if it's not in the natal promise, it just can't happen, all right? So here we've got Saturn ruling the midheaven. Saturn is here in the third house natally. And if you remember, we had that progressed midheaven to natal Saturn. We had transiting uh, Saturn, uh, transiting, what was it? Saturn to the midheaven, right? And where is Saturn posited? In the third house, communications. We're having a lot of energy to the natal Jupiter, uh, the, the sun Mercury conjunction this year. The sun rules the fifth house, which is children in love. And Mercury rules the sixth house, which is health or illness actually. And daily routine, Mercury also rules the third house of communications. And so these areas may come up most likely favorably because we did not see a predominant energy of squares and oppositions. We saw conjunctions, we saw trines, we saw sextiles, right? The flavor is positive. Then we see heavy Jupiter activity, Jupiter that, that solar arc, ascendant equals Jupiter, Jupiter ruling the ninth house, echoing. These are the main themes happening for your client over the next year. This is an art. You have to study this very, very carefully and take your time with it. And so we did see that one transit of Saturn. So Saturn is transiting through my 12th house and it will be square the moon. And that's in March, it was early March, I think. But that's just kind of hanging out by itself. Yeah, the moon's in my eighth house. Yeah, the moon rules my fourth. Could that be some kind of difficult news for a family member, for my father uh, connected to my household? Maybe, but it is not going to be disastrous because it's just one aspect hanging out there in the ethers when everything else in that time search was really talking about different subjects and a more auspicious kind of a feel for the year. So I didn't want you guys to think I was ignoring that difficult measurement, but I was, I, I want you to understand also how I put it in its proper place. And so you would communicate all this information to your clients. I hope I have achieved my goal in this video of showing you how this predictive astrologer organizes her measurements in preparation for a consultation with someone and then can communicate the information, identify key themes, make specific predictions. Of course, there's more details and nuances connected to it. I, If the client was asking about more pinpointed specific dates, you would consult your ephemeris and get those personal planets involved and look and see, well, are they triggering something? Mars, transiting Mars is a trigger, big trigger. So are eclipses, but any of the personal planets can trigger something. So let me know in the comments if this video was interesting, helpful, if you like this type of content, if it's just way over your head, if you wanna see more videos like this. And again, if you want, personalized instruction where I will mentor you and teach you how to learn how to do this, go to my website, 
get on the waiting list for one of my classes, whichever one is at your level of interest. And right now the registration is open for my solo arc direction and predictive astrology masterclass where we put all of this together. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Have a beautiful day, everybody. Bye.